This actually was one of the, the, the questions in the, in, in, in the exam, uh, in the test. It says one of the British values is A, having a university degree, B, right, uh, driving a car, C, uh, laughing at yourself, D, going to a pub and ordering a um, pint. I was like, can we all, all of them? Um, so it was laughing at yourself was a British value. And I understand this from Brexit, what's happening in Brexit. You know, it's like showing us, you know, making an example for all the refugees. Look how we laugh at ourselves. <laughs>
Should we get started? Sure. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Hi. <laughs> you can talk back. You can talk back to us. Um, thanks for coming to this live recording of Freelance Pod. My name's Sachandrika Chakrabarti, and I can hear myself going into the beginning of a podcast. And this is... Abdullah Bahan. And um, we'll be talking a lot about Abdul's journey from Syria to London, where he's been living for the last six years, and all the fun and less fun parts of that. We've also got some prizes to win on the table behind me. You might have seen some of these around. Um, So you could win some of these. There are stickers, there are masks, and we're going to be answering questions from the Life in the UK test. Who's, uh, Who's had fun with this book before? Anyone? We've got a whole room full of British citizens here. You feeling left out? Yeah, you have. Don't give the answers away. This is a really fun book, and we'll be trying out questions with you. And, um, yeah, shall we uh, get started with hearing from you, Abdul? Get cracking. Sure. Ah, oh, hello, everybody. Uh, how's it going? Good. Good. I don't feel any energy from this room, which is very weird. <laughs> oh. Um... So my name is Abdul, and uh, I live in here. I do some stand-up comedies here and there uh, to promote uh, what we do as a refugees around this country. Uh, also, you can always see us, but you don't know that we are refugees. Uh, we don't live in a cave. We live amongst people. Uh, that's why I'm wearing my jeans, ripped jeans, just to confirm my identity in case I see some racist people. And tell them, yes, I look like a refugee. I, will, I wear torn jeans. I have to look miserable all the time. That's, that's how kind of all the images that people see. A lot of time I get asked if I'm a refugee. I said, yes, I'm a refugee. And people don't believe me. They want kind of a proof to, to show them that I'm a refugee. And they have this f- image that people don't understand English, which is kind of true. Because when I first arrived in this country, I kind of have to learn English. That's why I don't speak British accent so far. Um, and I learned, I learned English the hard way. I remember going to Tesco and I bought a meal. And for this meal, I had to follow the instructions. I went home, I started reading the instructions, and the instructions confused me. And the instruction, it says, you have to preheat the oven. And I was like, wait a second, the oven only exists in two states. It's either heated or cold. Where is preheat? And I started calling my white friends. I call them white friends because these are the only British people I knew back then. And I said, what is preheat? I said, what do you mean what is preheat? You just preheat the oven. I still didn't understand it. And then I found out that British people are obsessed with this pre, like pre-register, when you register before you register, or pre-order, when you order before you order. I was really confused <laughs> with this pre, preheat, pre this. Um, and I remember, you know, a lot of English people telling me things that don't make any sense. I remember before taking a test once, uh, I asked my teacher, um, what should, you know, how, how do you prepare for the test? And he said, the best way to prepare is to expect the unexpected. <laughs> I was like, is that the same like preheat an oven? <laughs> expect the unexpected. How do you expect the unexpected? It was, it was very weird to me. And that's how I started, you know, learning English. I remember I volunteered once uh, in a university uh, at the University of Southampton, and they put me in the cloakroom. And I didn't know what the cloakroom was. And they told me that people come, they give you your, uh, their jackets, and you just direct them where everything is. It's fine. It was Sunday, and they told me everything was closed. So the cafe was closed, the canteen was closed, everything was closed. It's fine. So there was this come. He co- this, this guy, he comes in, and he looks kind of, you know, he needed to go somewhere and he asked he gave me his his uh jacket and he asked me where is the loo and i did not know where what is a loo i've never heard of a loo before all i we knew in syria we call it toilet and i remember that everything was closed so i told him i'm sorry sir the the loo is closed it's sunday nobody uses the loo in here he looked at me funny i didn't i still remember it but uh that was these are some of the things that happened across, along the way of learning Can I just check? Was there English. not a question about loose? No, no there was... In the, in the um, handbook of the asylum from the home office, there was nothing... Maybe someone needs to help Priti Patel to get yeah. a, a loose loo question in there. All right, so... Can you tell us a little bit about these pictures you yeah. kindly gave me for this slide? Yeah. So that was the picture that, that was my final picture, the last picture I took of Aleppo before leaving Aleppo back in 2013. 
I was uh, I was passing, and I was so lucky because there's a, a, a war plane came and bombed that building. Uh, fortunately, there were no people living in, the, in there, so nobody was killed. But that was the last photo I took. Um, that photo was my neighborhood. It's where I lived and I grew up, and I remember it uh, piece by piece. Um, it, so... It was pretty much, you know, I was one of the lucky people to, to have escaped Aleppo and made it to England to, you know, usually a lot of refugees, we go from Turkey into Europe and then I made it into this island. I still don't understand why I made this journey. <laughs> I still question this, it. By this island, do you mean the Great British, the Azov? Yeah, yeah, this <laughs> island, yeah, Britain. It's, it's an island uh, outside Europe, but yeah. But so, so these are the, the, this is the, the, the last photo I, I took of Aleppo, and I quite remember it. I was on the van, uh, walk, uh, on the van we were going to the borders. I was uh, already on my way to Turkey uh, when we stopped. We took some pictures, just like a tourist. <laughs> we stopped, we took some pictures of what happened. Was, luckily, nothing had happened that day, and then we, we, we continued our way uh, to Turkey. But what does it feel like to look at pictures like this of your home? It doesn't feel anything right now because I like, feel numb totally, um, especially after spending six years in here um, and feel like this is normal. And again, you'd feel you're so lucky that you've escaped, even though that I know this neighborhood uh, piece by piece. Uh, I spent all my life there. I was, I was raised, and I went to school for 12 years here and then university. We don't really, in, in Syria, we don't really go to universities as outside of your town or, or city most of the time you stay, especially if you're one of the big cities that have uh, universities. So I stayed in there, so I know this very well. So I, it was kind of sad and nice when I was leaving. I remember there, I think I will talk about it in, the ne in, in a few next slides. Uh, this was during the, um, before, this is after the Olympics, the London Olympics in 2012. Now I remember watching the Olympics in 2012 and I never thought that I would be in the same country uh, where the Olympics was going. And it was completely different reality that the Olympics was happening in one country while we're having airstrikes and the real fireworks in, 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 in Aleppo. So it is a completely different perspective. Wow, okay. So, um, so there is us. And then... We've gone over most of these, except maybe the journalist side. Can you tell us a bit more about getting into journalism back in the day and also in England? Because it's not been easy, has it? Yeah, back, back in Syria, so we didn't have really have any journalism back in Syria. If anyone from here from Arabic countries would understand... Anyone from Arabic countries? Nobody. So if you were in from Arabic country, you would understand that all the journalism you do in Arabic countries is to, to write reports to support the, uh, the party. There was only one party in Syria, the Ba'ath Party, and all the newspaper, all TV, just talk about uh, you know the president and how good he is, and er that's that's pretty much all the journalism. So I didn't study journalism. Um, I studied English literature, uh, so I studied Shakespeare, uh, and I was so surprised when I came here. People do not speak that language. I had to read <laughs> old English. I was really surprised. Uh, did not expect it at all. I remember when I first arrived, I said, oh, finally, I'm going to go to theater. And then I found that Shakespeare Theater is like 65 pounds a ticket. <laughs> I'm like, no, I'm not going. Thank you. I'd rather see it on the DVD for free from a streaming website. Um, uh, so, but back in Syria, I started uh, doing the activism against the, uh, the regime back in 2011. So we were just protesting in the streets. Um, uh, writing reports, it's, it's all started on Facebook, to be honest. Everything, we put it on Facebook, all the statements and all the protests telling each other where to go and how to mobilize, because we did not have a civic society in Syria. Uh, in Syria, everything was uh, controlled by the regime. Even the Red Cross was controlled by the regime, and you needed some connections in order to join. I remember going to join the Red Cross because I thought, okay, all the wealthy people work in the uh, Red Cross and they're all connected. So if I volunteer, I would have some connections because you need connections. And then they didn't accept me. And I was a volunteer and they refused me. 
I didn't understand it. And then they accepted my friend whose uncle works in, in one of the uh, police stations. Uh, so, so that was the, the, the case in Syria. We did not have any civic society. So Facebook was the platform where we mobilized ourselves and we taught each other where to meet and how to meet. And at the beginning, we didn't know pretty much how to, to, to organize a protest. But I think our worst protest is m much better than the best one here in London. Uh, Why is that? We go there, we have drums, we laugh, we, do, we, we dance. I've never seen people here dancing in a protest. Or I've seen some people with some, I don't know, like some, not songs, or chants. Like, what do you want? Where do you want it? Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> All these things. Like, yeah, well, where is the fun? So it's, not, it's not really fun. And there's no adrenaline rush. You know, in Syria, then the police attack you, and then you have to run for your life. <laughs> Here, police is around you, and they have portable toilet. A portable toilet. What is this luxury? It's possible, no. Yeah, Lou. And then you finish. You go to Starbucks, or you go to the pub, or somewhere. It's, we did not have this luxury in Syria, so it, it didn't feel like a protest in here. I remember going to a protest here uh, when I first arrived. It was like, yeah, the police is here. They're encouraging us. You can take pictures of the police. I went and told, told the police, what's wrong with you? Go and meet, meet some people. You know, don't you have a life to do? It was very weird. Um, so completely different. So when I, uh, um, when I crossed to Turkey, I started living in Turkey. I started working with a lot of journalists. Most of the journalists I worked with, uh, surprisingly, uh, were white middle-aged men. Uh, and they gave me lectures about my country and what was happening in my country, <laughs> of course, uh, without uh, any care about health and safety. We don't really have health and safety in Syria. Um, or, or, you know, an understanding of health and safety. So I worked with a lot of, as a fixer for a lot of journalists. And for those of you who don't know what a fixer means, uh, a fixer is someone who takes journalists back to Syria or to some places in order to chat about or to show them what's going on or to uh, uh, provide some people to talk to, take them to interesting places and checkpoints. And that was kind of my job. So I worked with a lot of journalists in there. And of course, every time one journalist wanted to, 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 to take a, you know, a picture or a video, they would put me out of the picture. They would put you know, one of these vests as press you know, and take a picture. That would be their profile picture later. Um, so that was, that was what I did. And then I worked on a documentary. Oh, it's a 52-minute documentary about the situation in Syria. And then I came here. And when I came here, I thought it would be so easy to get back into working as a journalist. Uh, but I was so wrong because I found all these jobs are taken by middle wh white uh, aged people. Uh, the same expert always goes from one TV to another. How so, many journalism jobs did you apply for when you got here? <laughs> I don't remember the exact number, but it's definitely more than 100. And whenever I get a reply, I always go to the second paragraph. It says, we regret or unfortunately so I don't even sometimes I get an email and I don't remember applying for this job <laughs> but yeah that's that's in here until I got back so there was a, a project called the refugee journalism project uh, it was launched here in the in London uh, in LCC by Vivian Francis she works at uh, London College of Communication where a lot of refugees uh, from you know who have any background in journalism would come and produce something. Uh, so I started working for an NGO, uh, uh, working on documenting airstrikes in Syria and started writing a report. Some of my reports uh, were presented at the UK Parliament, uh, which was great, uh, but didn't have any outcome, uh, unfortunately. Um, and other people started working you know, for Reuters for a couple of times. I wrote uh, a couple of articles, one for The Guardian, one for The New Arab. So. You know, you do a few things here and there. That's for journalism in here. Okay. Um, and then, a little about me. So I host Freelance Pod, which is a podcast about how the internet has changed work, particularly creative work. So I often speak to journalists, podcasters, graffiti artists, anyone like that. I'm a freelance journalist myself, and I was working at the London College of Communication and was a mentor on the Refugee Journalism Project. I was not your mentor, um, and Vivian, who's in charge, sent me your summary of the podcast that you're going to be making, which we'll talk about, which will let um, other refugees 
have their voices heard because it's not just about getting to the UK it's about trying to settle in as well which is pretty difficult so it was the funniest summary of a podcast I'd ever seen it really jumped off the page and I felt like I already knew what you would sound like when I read it as so when I met you I was like oh I think I feel like I know you and that was kind of the beginning of us getting this show together um, and yeah so you can also tweet at us if you want and I've got a newsletter which is thechantricate.substack.com and then that is all that follow us nonsense we shall move on to the life in the UK test now who fancies I think I see someone over there who fancies answering some questions before before taking the life yeah. in the UK test just a background on the life in the UK test so this is the test that you need to take if you want to live in the UK so after living in the UK here for six years since 2013 and after going out a lot to a pub that I did not understand the culture, I still don't understand uh, that. But this is where you meet people. This is where you meet people in this country. You go to pub. I remember going to the pub the first time uh, to have beer because I never had beer before in my life. It was the first time in here. And I always saw it in films. People, you know, say, oh, let's go to the pub. Let's have some beer. And, you know, it's like a cool thing to drink. I decided I wanted to go. I remember going there, went to the pub. I went to the, to, the, to, the, to the guy behind the bar and I said, can I have a beer, please? And he looked at me and said, which one? And I'm like, the beer. It's the only one. He said, we have all of these. I said, give me this one. And I was so disappointed with the taste. I could not, I could not finish it. I couldn't, I couldn't take more than four sips. But I started going to the pub and started getting, meeting a lot of people. So I lived in here for six years. And after these six years, um, I had a lot of different jobs. I worked as a cleaner, worked as a lecturer. So between cleaner and the lecturer, was a lot of different jobs. But I thought that this would make me prepared for this test. So this test, you have to take it. You have to pass this test in order to submit your application to live permanently. And this test cost um, 50 pounds. Is it 50 or 150? 50 pounds. Is a 50 pounds to take this test, and if you fail it, you have to pay 50 pounds again. And the test, you will get asked 24 questions, and you need to answer 18 right. If you answer 17 wrong, right, uh, you fail, and then you have to take it again. So, so let's let's uh, question your Britishness, guys. Yeah. Um, so how should we do this? I think you can call out the answers. The thing is, there are prizes to give away. If, if you're going to answer the question, please raise your hand and we'll get a mic to you because we are recording this session. Yeah, let's do that. And then we'll know who's won a prize as well. Okay, so remember, this is, you know, testing people to see if we should let them live in our country. Do we think they're going to be useful tests? Yes. Yes, yes, is the answer. Okay. I have Number to say one. yes because my application is still bending. At and the this moment. is being recorded. This is being recorded. Yeah. No one here works at the Home it's Office. Today. It doesn't matter if it's being recorded. It's going straight there. Why is William III's accession to the throne... William III, do you remember that guy? Yep. Um, why is his accession to the throne known as the Glorious Revolution? Come on, history buffs. A, it's multiple choice. Don't worry. I don't expect anyone to know. I don't know. A, it signaled the start of the Hundred Years' War. Why not? B, William of Orange defeated a much larger army. Who the hell is he? Um, C, it led to the Reformation and the formation of the Protestant church. Or D, there was no fighting in England. Does anyone want those again? A yes, lady, wait lady. Just She's wait for Mike. Mike. Is it C? It led to the Reformation and the formation of the Protestant church. Unfortunately not. Us nodding at each other did make it feel like that. Good try. It was D, there was no fighting in England. But can I just say, because you were the brave person to put your hand up first, do you feel free to come up and get a prize from the table? And yes, let's clap. <laughs> Bravery be rewarded. So yeah, go nuts. There's stickers, there's moss of Putin. I mean, I went for it. What was your name? Priscilla. Priscilla, thank you for coming up. <laughs> Enjoy. <laughs> um, okay, so let's, uh, let's keep going. Which of the following statements is correct? During the A, during the reign of Charles I, Parliament attempted to take control of the English army following a rebellion, rebellion in Ireland. Or B, there's only two answers here. During the reign of Charles I, Irish Catholics supported the views of the Puritans. Anybody? Oh, at the back. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Do you just want to win something? 
It, that's, that's one of the easiest questions when you get 50 Is 50. it? Yes. Oh, I see. Um, you because can't phone a friend. True, true or false. Okay. It's, it's it was A. I can't, I can't even read these back. Um, let's try this one. Which political party was Clement Attlee a member of? I reckon we could do this. Clement Attlee. A. Lib Dems. B. Conservative. C. Green. D. Labour. Labour. Labour it is. Yes. What's your name? See, two, two out of three. Not so bad. All right, let's do, let's do one more. Are we enjoying these? I mean, they're quite hard, aren't they? Okay, we'll do a couple more. Ask something other than the Parliament. Ask culture. I know. I I picked a read. Test seventeen was the Parliament one. Okay, a conflict in which of these areas in the nineteen ninety? So, most of us were born then, at least. Um, involved the British troops. A, the Maldives. Remember when we owned the Maldives. B, the former Republic of Yugoslavia. C, South Africa. D, France. So a conflict in the 1990s involving British troops. Maldives, former Yugoslavia, South Africa, France. Anybody? Lady at the back. Former Yugoslavia. Yes, well done. Woo, can we get a prize? I know who this person is. It's Dr. Bisharka Hughes. Couldn't wait to come and get her prize. Well done. Go, go for it. <laughs> Easy work. All right, should I do one more? And then... Do it. Do, someone, some, something other than the, something cultural. There are, there are a lot of cultural questions to make sure that you pay a lot of money to go to these places like the O2. I don't know if you can write that. There was there was there was a question that appeared in my in my exam asked me uh, where is the O2, and I remember someone asked me what is the O2. <laughs> okay, this this is similar. So which of these is a Gilbert and Sullivan comic opera, which surely is the first thing you learn at primary school in Syria? Yeah. Um, so A is it Evita? Could be. B is it Jesus Christ Superstar? <laughs> Could be. Yeah. Are you allowed to laugh this much in the test? Um, C, the Mikado. D, cats. Cats, very topical. Oh, everyone. I feel like your hand went up first. Yeah. It's C, and I, the rest are Lloyd Webber. Yes, the Mikado. Yes. Yeah. Please come and get your prize. Well done. Woo! What was your name? Zach. Zach. Well done. See, how would, how, would, how would a Syrian refugee know this? Like, I can't even afford to go to watch any of these plays. Because you didn't have Twitter back then, so you couldn't see the Cats trailer when it dropped. Because that was big. That I've, was very big. I've seen it. You've seen it I've now? Seen I've seen Cats. You've seen Cats? I've seen Cats. One of my friends uh, bought tickets. I was living in Southampton. One of my friends bought tickets, and she couldn't make it. She, she gave me the ticket for free. Did you like Cats? No. The musical? <laughs> What did, did you not like about I Cats? Did, I did not understand. What about it. the song Memory? That was very beautiful. Yeah, that was the only song that I had to wait all the, the, the play to, to, for this song. Is it something about the half-cat, half-human hybrid that mm, doesn't do it for no, you? No, I, I didn't understand why adults dress like cats and <laughs> dance on the stage. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> we don't need Twitter if you say stuff like that. You just, who needs Twitter? Fair enough. Okay, we will come back to the Life in UK test. Well done to everyone who's won a prize. There'll be more, don't worry. So, let's move on to... Oh, this picture of you when you were young. I've really hyped it up now. Oh, it's there he is. There he is. So it's me in the middle, the glasses, the only one with the glasses. So this podcast is normally about the analogue and the digital, how the internet's changed stuff. So can you cast your mind back to your youth in Aleppo and tell me about when you first got the internet, when you first got mobile phones, and what was that like? Because it's quite different to how you experienced it here. Um, back in here, it's, I think, uh, we've had the cell phones for a couple of, of years and then, but that's with, with in 2003. Uh, we had a cell phones for a couple of years. But before, before that, we did not have any cell phones, we did not have internet, um, uh, we were we had only two channels on TV. Uh, first channel is you know we have one hour of cartoon and that's it. And then the second channel sounds good. Was not for a kid, and uh, we had six days of school, not five. So the weekend was only Friday. Um, it is not Friday and Saturday like it is now. And uh, only one hour of cartoon 
and um, the second channel was only in English and French, even though nobody in Syria speaks English or French. So I don't understand why we had the second channel. So we had only one channel on TV. It's the country was very closed, so it was kind of like what you read about now in North Korea. So we did not have TV satellite. We had the TV. We did not have satellite. We did not have internet or cell phones. I remember people coming from other countries. For example, uh, my father uh, lived. He he was a truck driver in in Emirates, and when he come to visit us every year in summer. He would bring us like uh, pens, like pilot pens or something like this, like similar to this one. And my friends were like, "Ooh, what, what are these pens? We've never seen them before. And it was similar things, like it's a very small thing, like chocolate. I remember the first time I had Snickers, this was when I was like 12 years old. I have Snickers chocolate. And it's like I couldn't finish it on one day. I was like, I was saving it, having one bite <laughs> each day because it was the only one that my father gave me because he, we were like seven children and he gave one to each one and I have more than 40 uh, cousins. So how many boxes of chocolate would you bring <laughs> to give to all these the kids? So the country is very, very close country. Uh, it was it was cheap for you know to live in. And if, if I think of it now... But it was not a pleasant place to, to, to live in because there's pretty much nothing. Uh, um, unemployment was very high. Uh, there was no workers' right at all. Even Again, I'm just thinking of it right now. So how about the internet? What did you have to do to get the internet? It wasn't a case of just waiting in for three months when BT comes around, which is what we do in England. Uh, and every time I move house, just wait. Um, it's a bit more complex and it involves... The internet was, was amazing because when it first uh, we got internet, it was in 2003, by the time I was in this picture. It was in 2003 and um, if, you need, if you want to have internet, then you need to have a license from the government. So you need to be either an engineer or a doctor. And my brother was a doctor, was studying, was, hasn't finished yet, so he had a license. And we had only 20 hours of internet a month. That's not enough internet. That's not. That's that's, that's not great for a dial-up. If you remember the dial-up, dial if you remember the dial-up, it you know it takes two minutes to connect to the internet. That's 28 minutes. It takes t two minutes to connect to the internet, and then uh, once you're connected, it's very slow. You can only read articles. That's only only you can't even see pictures. And forget about YouTube. It's impossible. Um, but a lot of websites were censored anyway. So we could read some articles. Um, cell phones were very expensive. I remember this, the f cell phone when they first arrived, it was $1,000 to buy a SIM card. And then we had the first phones we had were like Nokia 3310. I don't know if you remember them uh, from back in the days. The classics, the classics. Yeah. Yeah. And the, we used to play the snake on them. Uh, they were very, very expensive. Uh, but this, you know, that was for the the upper class people, and they would install some songs on them. There's no songs, but you know, there's these beats that imitate the song or these t tweets, or whatever you call them in English. You know, it's like it's not like real music. Yeah, it's no, like kind no. of very free an, very music. annoying music that makes you think of a song. Uh, okay, my phone is ringing. I need to shut up. So yeah, that's it. So it was it was very expensive. It's very it's a country that was very closed. Uh, I saw, I saw tourists because I worked later in a hotel. I worked as a receptionist, and all the tourists I always wonder what brings them here. And all the tourists were religious tourists, so they come because they said Jesus Christ was in Syria. I said I'm sure not now, not anymore. <laughs> and they would always we always sell them. You know, they're all all the tourists were white, all of them. Uh, I've never seen any Chinese, for example, or Japanese or black person. They're always white, and we always, always, all, always sell them these uh, traditional clothes that look so silly in them, and they look so happy. <laughs> I've never seen hap you know, the happiest person is a white person wearing traditional clothes of another country. <laughs> and we tell them, you look great, mate, you look great. And, um, and you know, you, you whip up the charges, you know, it's like, it costs maybe three pounds and you sell it for 10 pounds and they would think it's a bargain. Can you describe these kinds of outfits to us? I don't think we have a picture. Uh, the outfit, I think it's a very traditional one. You see it sometimes in, uh, on, you know, if you're watching things from early days. It's, it's kind of a fashion right now, I think. It's kind of a trousers. It's like, I don't know, that very baggy and uh, made of, uh, I don't, it's, they're not, 
it's a very baggy black trousers and uh, a white shirt and then there's kind of a thick belt it's like a it's not a scarf but it looks like a scarf you want to put it around your neck but you don't put it around your neck you put it around your waist and then you put some red thing here like a hat but it's not a hat i don't know what's what you call it you have to have a head covering definitely yeah, yeah. because we're bald yeah. see <laughs> then we always cover things so what i like is that i feel like if there was a syrian version of the life in syria test that i feel like i'd be a bit closer to answering that question how to not get ripped off how to not get ripped yeah. off yeah don't look white <laughs> okay i've got that down um, so so how about all oh, um we mentioned when we were talking about the show one good thing about the having mobile phones was that people could document war so could you tell us a bit about the turkey syria border and what it was like being there at that time all right um so back in then um the cell phones were very expensive when they first um were introduced in our country and later on they got cheaper and cheaper um and the country started getting uh, uh, sorry, getting you know a lot of business from outside and people and sorry you know opening a little bit and uh, cell phones started getting cheaper um, and um, for us pretty much everyone back in 2011 when we started the uprising against Assad pretty much everyone had a cell phone that has a, you know a, cr- a camera even the cameras were not great but you know they would document so if you look at if you watch YouTube. If you go back to 2011, if you all these videos from 2011 before, they're either shot on a digital, cheap digital camera or a phone uh, camera. But pretty much everyone had a phone. And uh, these phones were the reasons why there was the uprising were kind of successful or made it, commi- um, made it a lot of noise in now because everything was documented. Unlike the 80s, during the 80s, there was an uprising against Assad. He crushed it. He killed over uh, estimated between, according to the UN, between ten and forty thousand people in three weeks in in Hama. According to to people in, in Aleppo, uh, within there's over a hundred thousand people were killed in, th- in these three weeks. It is not covered. It is because we were in a very close country, but because of the cell phones and internet, we had access to. Uh, we started, you know, writing things and put it on Facebook and online. So, face, so cell phones created a huge difference. And this is the difference between what's happening in Yemen and what's happening in Syria. Because I worked at, when I arrived here in 2015, I worked as a Yemen researcher for Amnesty International for a short period of time. And the difference between Yemen and Syria is that in Yemen, not everyone has a cell phone. Not everyone can document what's going on. So we had a, a uh, someone in, in Yemen, and we'd ask them to drive to some place in order to go there and check if there was an airstrike or something. While in Syria, you did not have to. Until now, when I was doing my report, I can contact people living in Raqqa, or living under ISIS-controlled area, and I can get some verifications, videos, names, pictures, you know, in, in these places. These people were risking their lives talking to me and talking to other journalists. But if you want the information, you can get it. It's completely different to Yemen, where it's, that was you know, a very poor country. They did not have cell phones. So cell phones were the, the real deal for Syria. And this is why you would see a lot of coverage, I think, in Syria. Because we made it. If you make it online, then you know, media would pay attention, I guess. So the difference from one Assad and then his son kind of not treating the country very well the difference is that it can be documented yes it's the documentation so Assad Assad his father during the 80s killed a lot of people it's I he, one of some of my cousins were killed my uncles never lived in, in Aleppo or Syria they were living in Saudi Arabia and Qatar because they were wanted by the Syrian regime we never joined the the, the, the party ourselves and uh, at all because you know we were not welcome anyway uh, because of what happened during the 80s but uh, for but that was not document that was not properly documented back in the eighties or nobody cared I don't know but in two thousand eleven we had cell phones we had cameras we documented everything we put it online so we 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 made a difference I guess so it's fascinating that the internet has kind of changed how we document history it's more open to everyone you, you could document what was going on at home even though it's a closed country which is something it's more than what we had in the 80s um so what we have here is the syria turkey border probably after you've left because it's more fortified the flags only came in later right they were they, they were there when i left 
Oh, the flags were there when you left. Excellent. Were there. Yeah. Uh, full mars. And what we're going to look at next, um, on the next slide, is a film that Abdul worked on um, called The Suffering Grasses. So could you tell us a bit about this? This, this film was the ticket for me to get here. Uh, I made enough money for it. So I worked with a production company to make this um, uh, film. It's a documentary, 52-minute documentary about the, the war in Syria. It's called The Suffering Grasses. Um, and in it we talk about the Syrian refugees who crossed to Turkey back then there was only 40,000 refugees in Turkey it's the very first beginning and uh, I was one of them and I worked as a uh, fixer and a translator and this is the school where I worked in, when I was in Turkey at the Syrian border so you will see me talking about my friend in here who was protesting in, in Aleppo and uh, you will see a guy who lost his house and who was also talking from the Syrian uh, Turkish crossing borders. So we'll just watch those two clips now. One of my friends was in a protest. They were protesting peacefully. And they started saying we were peaceful and uh, protest, we were peaceful protest. But the security forces started shooting at them. And then some people were injured. And then yet, they said, like, we're peaceful. And then they raised their hands. The shooting didn't stop. So they started just caving and running. And after that day, I called my friend and said, you're OK? And he told me that I just want a weapon. Give me some weapons, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you how it is. Uh, so the second one would be from the, uh, the Syrian-Turkish borders. And this is a guy talking about how he lost his house. Uh, but he can still see across the borders. These are the mines that were uh, planted across the borders and where some people died. To 20, 2044 for the beginning of the clip, please. When um, you've said to me before that when you were living in Syria, that border wasn't fortified and it wasn't as dangerous to cross. No, the border is so uh, there. We share all over 800 kilometer with Syria, <laughs> uh, with Turkey. Uh, so the borders, part of the borders were open, part was of it was you know uh, a fence, a barbed wire. So part of it uh, where you can see in here in a little bit that there's no borders, people can just cross. In, in some places. In other places, there was a fence. Uh, I crossed back and forth a couple of times through the fence, but we had we cut a hole through the fence. And I remember the Turkish uh, border guard looking at me like, how many times are you going to cross? <laughs> you again. <laughs> Make your mind, man. Come in or go in. Uh, so they were very friendly back then. Uh, there was no problem. I don't understand why the border, the, the, the guards were there, to be honest, because if they let everyone come in, in and out. But later on, especially recently, uh, after the EU's deal with, the, uh, with Turkey to stop the, all those migrants crossing, so they kind of closed all the borders. And over the past two years, uh, I documented in my research I was doing, documented over 130 people shot dead by the uh, Turkish uh, guards, border guards. So it's, not, it's a very serious thing now. And I know some of the people uh, I know wanted to cross to Turkey, but they didn't, they couldn't, and because the borders were shot, so they had to bribe uh, someone at the borders, and the bribe was like uh, $1,500 per person. So imagine if you have a family of like, I don't know, seven, it's kind of impossible to raise all this money. And this is, this is the same thing for the, if you want to live in, in the UK, if you want to apply for citizenship, yeah, the, the fees is 1,350 pounds. So again, if you are, have a family of seven, forget about applying. But anyway, this is, this is the, uh, the, the, the clip of showing the borders and where I could see, because Aleppo is on the borders, so I can't see Aleppo from here, but I can see the, the Aleppo countryside from the borders. The border is. That's my city there. 
there. These are the Syrian borders. Aleppo is like over there. The outskirts of Aleppo. You see that tower? These are the borders here. There's no fence, just wheels. Anyone can just cross. هاي بين يلي هاي هدا وكنت نزل خيمي انا تحت حرق لي حرق لي كافة اضراضا وحرق لي سيارتين بس بس ايش عامل له بالشهر الاسد يعني انا شو سويت له للنظام السوري يعني حتى هدرني وهدر اولادي وحرمني حرمني بيتي وحرمني اراضي يعني شو سويت له شو عملت له يعني انا لا حاربته ولا تظاهرت ضده ولا عملت شيء ضده يعني ليش حرق ليش هدرني وطششني لبلاد ثانيه يعني شو عملت له يعني The Syrian regime don't want people to go to Turkey or to live in an or to Jordan because once you're out, you can talk, you can tell, and you can verify a lot of things. So they don't want people to leave. They have a lot of tanks, snipers, and um, checkpoints along this, uh, uh, on the road. But there are still a lot of illegal ways to cross the borders. <laughs> حطوا مشان يمنع البشر ترجع لبيوتها يعني انفجرت اكثر من حارس يعني انفجر على اكثر من شب يعني هاي الغوم اللي بتتوسع هون على التركية يعني So it sounds like that border became much more dangerous after you left. Yes, uh, definitely. Uh, back then when I left 2013, it was, you know, anyone can cross, anyone can come in and out. Uh, but there have been a couple of, of incidents at the border. So a couple of cars uh, uh, were uh, loaded with explosive went off. Uh, the border is killing civilians and killing people. So they closed them a couple of times and now it's kind of impossible to go to Turkey. If you're a Syrian, if you live in Syria, it's kind of impossible to cross from Syria into Turkey. I think we've seen a lot of closing of borders across that region and in, into Europe in the, kind of, in the six years you've been here. Um, why have I got a picture of your local post office up here? This is the post office. This is where I lived for some time. I was living in a post office. I did not tell my parents. I told my parents I'm out of the country, but I was actually in the country uh, because I could not leave. I, I needed to see what's going on in the war. And now I use this line every time I want to view uh, some room to live in. And they asked me, the host, like, do you like the room? I said, I lived in a post office. <laughs> of course I lived there. I love this room. I, there's a, a roof on top of my head. I'm happy. So back in here in the, the post office in Aleppo, this is a place called Qadi Askar. Um, and this place was really safe for me. Uh, somehow, I felt safe in the post office. The regime would not bomb the post office for reasons I, d I have no idea about. But they would not bomb it. They would bomb everything else. They would bomb a cemetery, a bakery, a building, everything but the home office. This is a question for the Life in the Syria test. What would the regime bomb? <laughs> Except the whole of it. And I was, I was in the post office making free calls because, you know, there's a landline. <laughs> making the free calls. Were you doing photocopies as well? Getting Every, stamps, you yeah? You can do whatever you want. It's the post office. You can do whatever <laughs> you want. And I was living a dream. It was like, oh, this is amazing. This is the post office. So when I, it's a huge, look, it's a huge. It's like four, four stories long. That square footage would cost you a lot in London. Yeah, so when I came here, I saw the post office inside a grocery shop. Uh, what kind of... Post office, do you have in here? Oh, the post office be this. Well, what's, what's wrong with our post offices? It's, they're very small, they're tiny. <laughs> uh, where, where is, look at this, look. Huge. Four floors. What? Four <laughs> floors. Are you sure that's not a Primark? No, it's, it's the post office. What is Four happening floors. on each floor? Where were you sleeping? I was sleeping here. Uh, sleeping here on the on the. Um, is is that because if something happens to the building, you're safest on the ground floor? No, because there were other people <laughs> upstairs. <laughs> As we know, I was so usually it's families or people you know with with power or whatever they would go live upstairs in single or people who are just 
Yeah. Have no power and no say. There was still a bit of a hierarchy yeah, even yeah, when course. you were hiding out. Yeah, of course. The, the families get the best house, the best seat in the house, always families. In, in the post office. Everywhere. Um, who else is in the post office with you? Uh, people I had no idea about, um, you know, people running away from Assad as well. You know, normal, a lot of people, you just sleep wherever you want. It's, it's, it's a huge. So you just find a place for you, yourself, find a quarter and sleep. Um, what is that relationship like, all being in this building together, not knowing what's going to happen tomorrow? What does that feel like? Um, it, it was, it was, it was, at least you felt safe. I really felt safe in the post office. It feels very weird to say it, but I felt safe in the post office, which belongs to Assad, the one I was, you know, going against and making phone calls from, you know, on his, on the taxpayers. We don't have taxpayers in Syria. But anyway, but it was it was uh, okay. You just didn't know what you're going to do. So um, some people would come and give food to us to the you know, people who are living in the post office, um, and we would eat whatever we find. Uh, sometimes we 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 go out, um, and you know. But I stayed there temporarily for like a week or so. So it's not a long period of time. Uh, the people there living living there or passing by, you know, just start talking to them and uh, later some some of them died some of them didn't some of them ended up in europe but you know you don't really keep a relationship because during the war um all relationships are just temporary because you never know who's gonna die the next day so you can't really invest in in friendship or de- you know such relationship with people because you never know who's gonna die tomorrow so it's just full-on survival mode just trying to get to tomorrow Yes, and making free phone calls for free. It's nice to know it's on a sad time, isn't it? Um, so, who wants some more life in the UK test questions? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, so I don't feel I chose the best ones. No, they were... The, go on. Let me go on. Mine. Be on the other side for once. Okay. Um. Lots of prizes still to play for, obviously. Yeah, I remember one of the questions where, where did the, um, in the test I had, where did the engineers in the Middle Ages come from? I I mean... What engineers? (laughs) Which one? And I had the choice between Germany, Netherlands, um, Belgium, and France. And I think Belgium was put there just, you know, to give me an easier choice. It's not Belgium or France. It's either Netherlands or Germany. And I thought Germany, but I was wrong. It's Netherlands. I thought people just get high there. Didn't know they have engineers. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the question, uh, yes, this is this is my favorite one of them, my friend. Which of the following will help you get along with your neighbors? <laughs> Wait, is it is this to do with Amsterdam? No. Okay. No. <laughs> um, a only putting rubbish and recycling out on collection days. <laughs> B. Uh, what is recycling? I don't know. Anyway, B, <laughs> having an untidy garden. Ooh. C, making lots of noise, especially late at night. Oh. D, only introducing yourself to them after a year. <laughs> this is the best question. This is a real question. Oh, go on, Felix. Felix. Oh, wait a second. Do you want to give the microphone to, to this guy? Yeah. Did you raise your hand, sir? Sir. Yeah. He was on it. Sorry, what's your name? Felix. Are you British, Felix? Uh, via Belgium. Via Belgium. Oh! You, you're not one of those engineers that were sent here, were you? I'm not a Belgian engineer. No. <laughs> so what was the answer for this question? In the UK, uh, it is definitely D. You never introduce yourself to your neighbours. <laughs> not you not want even... You to get on with them well. <laughs> Just avoid them. Not even after a year. <laughs> not, I mean, like... If you have to. <laughs> like if somebody dies in the front garden. Uh, yeah, yeah, like if you've got their post. And they're dead. I think the, uh, I think the test wants you to answer A, though. But it's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to query the answers to the test, we can guide you towards Pretty Patel in the Home Office. Good luck with that. Uh, what was the answer? Uh, the answer, of course, is only put in rubbish and recycling out on, collecting day, on collection days. I like how unimaginative the person who wrote that question and answer was. The answer is all of them, and not to have neighbours, and to try and live in a large post office if you can. 
Um, okay, there's another one. Um, I feel you should still get a prize, though. I think it still gets a prize. Yeah. yeah. Why not? Why not? You are awesome. You are awesome. Another one of the my cultural questions that I really like. Um, which one did you go for? Which one is it? Oh, he's gone for Bojo. I love that you said the Prime Minister. <laughs> Is he still our Prime Minister? Are we sure? Day to day, who can say? So, um, which of the following is covered by criminal law? Drunk and disorderly behavior? Dispute with your landlord? Employment issues such as unfair dismissal? Or debt? Um, Well, hold on a second. Get the mic. I'm getting the A. Drunk and disorderly behavior. I think this is very British of you. <laughs> is that you should be rewarded. Because that's the only way British people talk to each other. <laughs> I've never talked to anyone on the street or on the bus or anywhere. The only way people talk to me is in a pub. That's it. That's when they get, have, have their pint or whatever. In it, mate. Um, so, yeah. What do we get her? Yeah, go Christina, get, get a prize. Go on, Christina. Um, can I just quickly ask, can you just tell us your thoughts on red wine and what's wrong with it? Everything's wrong with it. Uh, again, it's, it's red wine. Um, when I was, again, I learned English, old English from Shakespeare and modern English from films. And you guys don't produce any films, which films? except for James Bond, which is not very um, common in Syria, James Bond. Uh, so we watched a lot of American films instead of British films but we have only, only one anyway. So in these films that we saw, a lot of people have steak and red wine all the time. And I thought, red wine is sweet wine that people really enjoy. And one of my friends, I arrived here, and uh, he's a friend of mine. It's very weird to say he's a friend of mine. He is really a dear friend of mine, and he's a UKIP supporter. And he, <laughs> he welcomed me into his home. He never kicked me out. But he's a UKIP supporter, which is very weird. He still welcomes me every time I talk to him. Anyway, so this guy said he's making steak for me. I said, great. I said, I want to try wine. I always thought red wine goes with steak. He said, bring whatever wine you want. I went and to, to off license. which I don't understand why it's off license. What on license? It should be on, not off. Anyone know? Uh, no. Always, oh, oh, late lady over here, because she has the microphone. There might be a prize in it for her. There's definitely a problem. This lady, the blonde lady. I think it means you have to take it off the premises. You can't start boozing immediately. Uh, can you speak English, please? I don't understand what you said. You can't drink your water. Okay, yeah. I didn't drink anywhere anyway. Uh, so I went to this one of these off license and I, bought, I, I gave 20 pounds to the guy. I said, give me red wine. And Is that how you spoke to someone no. in the office? I said, I, can I get a red wine bottle, please? And said, which one? Again, I said, I don't know. I said, what's your budget? I said, 20 pounds. I said, okay, give me your money. Here's your bottle. So I got this bottle. I went to my friends. He opened it with neat special thing, like a cork stuff. Cork screw? Yeah. Oh, you are failing that test. Yes. <laughs> it wasn't in there. Uh, so we got it. And he, he, he poured some for me, and you know, he was sort of pretending like he knows his wine, you know, doing this to smell it or whatever. And then I had it, I had a sip. It was awful. It was very, it was not what I expected. Could you tell us something about the bouquet and what notes were you tasting in this? I was wine? tasting some disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> disappointment was made into a glass all these years. You thought this is sweet. And then you tried it, and it's not sweet at all. I think you thought red wine was Ribena. It, I, have, I have no idea. Because I did. This is what people were drinking in the films whenever they had a steak or something. like. Red, all I knew that red, uh, red wine was steak, white wine with fish, and beer in the pub after you know, in a hot day. These, these were what I learned from films. And a martini in a James Bond film, I, Shaken We, we did not really watch a lot of James Bond. It's not that popular. So... We did not really. I have no idea about martini. Later, I, I, I learned it. Do you I like think. martinis? Uh, not really. I don't, <laughs> don't really drink alcohol. But I've, I've tried it. But so wait, the, the Eng, moving to England put you off drinking? No, I've, I started in England. Yeah, but then and I stopped in England. 
That was that was as far as I got. Um, so um, one other question. Um, yes. Um, great. So they have this question about television programs, which, you know, as a refugee coming from Syria, we had only two channels. I don't understand how many hours of TV you need to spend in order to understand this question. So the question was, which of the following is a famous British television series? A, Touch in the Void. B, Lord of the Rings. C, in which we serve, D, Monty Python's Flying Circus. <laughs> All right, I know the answer because I took this exam, but I had no idea what this, what the words here mean. Like who is? Yeah, well, let's let's find out. Do you guys know the answer? Does everyone know the answer? I think this is the easiest. There's a lady shaking her hand, her head. Sorry, are you British? No, I'm not. You're not British. Okay, unfortunately. <laughs> are you going to take the test? Maybe, at some point. <laughs> do, you want, do you want to give her the mic? You, are you going to take the test? Do you have to take it? Um, not yet. I mean, I've been here for three years, but I'm German, so at the moment I don't need to. But okay. I might have to at some point. <laughs> well, you never know. We'll find out on the 31st of October. <laughs> yeah, we'll we, we, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, anyone else who, who knows the answer? For this, which one, one, which of these series? It is the it is it is Monty Python's Flying Circus. Uh, I I never watched it. Uh, I have no idea who Monty Python was, or pretty much anything about it. So that's that's pretty much all the questions that people need. Really, I don't know how how you guys can can what why understanding Monty Python. Okay, they're upsetting British. you. They're upsetting Make you. Make me tell. more British All than, right. than you, for example. Well, exactly. So let's try. Let's try one more. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, this is a good one. So there are four possible answers. I'm just looking for one. What was depicted in the stained glass windows of many cathedrals built in the Middle Ages, possibly by high Dutch architects, engineers? A, stories about kings and coronations. B, stories about battles and victories. C, stories about the Bible and saints. D, stories about communities and farming. What do we think? Do we think it's A, kings and coronations? Seems about right. Maybe. B, battles and victories. Why not? C, Bible and the saints. I mean, maybe. D, communities and farming. <laughs> is, someone, is someone just yelling Jesus? Jesus. Do you know what? You, you get a point for that. Just, just, go. <laughs> just not even wait for the microphone. You just needed me to know. Go on, go on, have a prize. The answer is indeed Bible and the Saints. Arguably also the Son of the Lord, as we heard there. Bible and Saints. What's your name? Liz. Liz, well done. Thank you. Never has yelling Jesus ever brought people so many prizes. So, should we go on to... Instead of Jesus in Syria, we yell Muhammad. <laughs> At podcast recordings when they want prizes. Whenever, whenever someone says Jesus to me, I say Muhammad. Yeah, <laughs> well, like quite in a quite annoyed way. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong one. So let's talk about um, a nice win for you. You got involved with the Refugee Journalism Project at London Com College Communications, how we met. And kind of through that scheme, you got to write this really nice piece about laughing at yourself, does that make you more British? Can you tell us you know, what you've learnt about what it means to be British from Ali's favourite book mm. and also in terms of writing this piece? Uh, this actually was one of the, the, the questions in the, in, 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 in the exam, uh, in the test. It says one of the British values is A, having a university degree, B, right, uh, driving a car, C, uh, laughing at yourself, D, going to a pub and ordering a um, pint. I was like, can we all, all of them? Um, so it was laughing at yourself was a British value. And I understand this from Brexit, what's happening in Brexit. You know, it's like showing us, you know, making an example for all the refugees. Look how we laugh at ourselves. <laughs> so, so I was like, okay, if I laugh at myself, does that make me British? Uh, and they started looking at all these things that I have to go through. For example, 
uh, taken this test, uh, which I had to take twice uh, because the first time they didn't let me in because I didn't have a up-to-date bill. They needed an, an up-to-date bill in my name, uh, not older than three, three months, and mine was like six months old from the home office. So they didn't let me in. So the next time I had to bring my uh, a bank account statement to get in the test. So I l one, uh, 50 pounds was, went down the drain. And you have to take uh, a language test, which is 150 pounds, which lasts for like 10, 10, 10 minutes. And I think people think we are mentally challenged in this test. So you go to the test and they ask you, do you like colors? What is this color? And you know, for like this 10 minutes. And if you answer, all the answers are accepted and that's 150 pounds. And then on top of that, you have to pay uh, 1,350 pounds to apply for a citizenship. Um, and the uh, application takes, it was like almost 30 pages long. They ask you all these details that you don't even remember, like my father's birthday. I don't even know my father's birthday. He doesn't even know it. Like, it's not a thing we celebrate in Syria. So they want your, your parents' birthday and where every one of your parents is and everything about you, your tax. And this is the thing I don't understand because they know, the home office knows everything. They know where I am now, I guess, if, if no one in the crowd is from the home office following <laughs> every single refugee. I hear they're really big fans of this podcast, actually. Yeah. <laughs> so they, 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 have, they have all my profile on, in hand, so I don't understand why they would you ask you all of this. So at the top of all of this, you have to wait up to six months. So I've been waiting since May to hear from the home office, and all this time you just wait uh, until you hear from them. So during this test, I learned about Monty Python. I learned that there are 15 golf course, I guess, in England. That's written in the exam. I learned that the O2 is in Greenwich, and there's another one in Scotland called SSEN or SEN or something like this. If you show me the uh, um, the letters, I can put them together, but I can't, I can't remember it on top of my head now. Uh, can I just check? Do you know? Do you know? Do you remember the answers to this one? Which two of the following are British values based on? A traditions. B EU law. <laughs> <laughs> It's definitely C, not EU law. Yeah. C, party politics. D, history. And I'm going to chuck one in. E, whatever Boris Johnson says. So A, traditions. B, EU law. C, party politics. D, history. Or actually, I'm going to change it to whatever Dominic Cummings says. Um, I think it's whatever whatever comes out of your your mouth after having a pint or two. That is the right answer. That, that yes. is. You get one. It is. It is. There were there were questions about 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 you know food. I don't even know how to pronounce. Like people in Northern Ireland cook this fried Ulster or Oler, whatever it's pronounced. Yeah. Can we what get a microphone over to Sarah, please? What is it again? I said Ulster fried. All right. Do you know how to make it? Uh, no, I'm not. I'm not actually from Northern Ireland. Okay. You just you just want to annoy me to pretend that you know how. <laughs> But you don't really know how. It's a fire. There's um, like white pudding, black pudding, yeah. sausages, rashers, and not big beans. So. The ingredients were in the book, actually, like how to make it. And I was like, this is not a recipe book. This is, <laughs> this is how to be British. Uh, there was no question about the NHS or, you know. Uh, there was a question, to be honest, of drugs, that you should not take drugs, and that the only drugs you can take is paracetamol or something from, from the uh, pharmacist. And it's like, well, a second, Wait, I live in London. You know, drugs are all around me. You know, I can make a phone call, and they, they, they have delivery, home delivery, <laughs> just to my place, whatever you want, on Instagram. What kind can... of delivery do you have? <laughs> it's customized. <laughs> I don't take drugs just... So the home office is listening. <laughs> but can I just say what I loved about Sarah's description of the Ulster Fry? There's like several pork products in there, none of which you would be getting in Syria. And you wouldn't know what a white pudding and a black pudding were and how they were different and that they weren't sweet. I know That's the, a tough one. I know they're pudding. You know, you know the, would you pair one with a fine, sweet red wine? Maybe, with a marmite on top. <laughs> um, so tell, tell us about writing for The Guardian then. How... Um, how did you find writing, writing this? 
Uh, it was so much fun because I was writing about this life in the UK test, the book actually itself, which was which was not accurate. It has some mistakes. So it talks about the European, uh, uh, the EU, the European Union, which you know we're crashing out, maybe or not. I don't know. But in the book, it says that we're crashing out. So I I will I would I tend to believe them. I tend to believe spoilers everything written in the book. Uh, there were some uh, some references to a very racist uh, poet. Uh, po- uh, poet. He was originally from India, I guess. Uh, I think I've told you about him. He was uh, in his his uh, poetry was about uh, the colonies, and they were a great thing. Uh, Kipling. Yes, <laughs> that guy. And he was he was portrayed in the book as a good guy. Um, in the book was also things about uh, UK colonies and how great they were. And I was like, I don't know because British didn't colonize us. They gave us the French. We were not good enough to be colonized by British people. <laughs> and I was so upset. That was after World War I when Jordan and Iraq was given British, British colonies and Syria and Lebanon were French. And it was so, so there was all, the, all these sorts in, in, in the book that... But writing for the Guardian was great. Um, uh, it's it's good to to put your name out there, even though once in a lifetime. <laughs> but it's good. We'll get you back in there. We'll get you back in there. Um, so let's have some more. Let's have some more questions, shall we? Hmm. Do people want to win some more prizes and answer more ridiculous questions? Um, what about? Oh, okay. What about this one? Who could not get Parliament to agree to their religious and foreign policy views and try to rule without Parliament? Was it A. Charles I, B. Elizabeth I, C. Bloody Mary, D. Henry VIII, or E. Dominic Cummings? <laughs> Charles I, Elizabeth I, Bloody Mary, Henry VIII, whoever's in charge when we leave this room. Could be anyone. What do you think? What do you think? Anyone? Oh, Ian, go for it. Henry No, it was Charles the First, but oh. yeah, you can have British. That's your prize. <laughs> it's from the great county of Essex, like myself. Oh no, you, you get a prize. It's all right. Go on, let's let's give you one more go. Let's let's see if you can get another one. Um. Hmm. Oh, this is fun. Which of the following statements is correct? It's A or B, so it's 50-50. You can ask your friend next to you if you must. Um, A, the Cabinet's decisions often have to be debated or approved by Parliament. B, the Cabinet's decisions must always be debated or approved by Parliament. So A, Cabinet kind of can do what they want. Is that our country, do we think? Or B, no. B. B. It's A. Oh. Cabinet can do what they want. Oh, Ian. Oh, okay. Um, and then... Oh, I keep getting back to that musical one. What, what did you think of that question? Do you like that one? Which one? The one I just asked about whether the, the government could do what it wants, basically, without Parliament. Uh, I come from Aleppo, so they do whatever they want. So, with, with, the political, no with the political stuff going on at the moment in England, is it like, you're like, oh, bless, they're only learning about... No, I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying it so much. What do you like about it in particular? I feel home now. This is this you know this country is destroying itself. It's getting feeling home. And like Syria, oh, Syria is destroyed, and now it's destroying itself. Oh, I feel home. I feel welcome. They're doing it for me. So Every good. time you go past the post office, you got to think oh, that's not One big day. enough. I start, no, I started picking the home of Israel. And which one would I crash into? There's some good ones in central London. Some lovely Gothic ones. Okay, one question for the audience. When did Parliament, as we know it today, begin to develop? Can you see a theme? Can you see what's been on my mind? A, the Iron Age. B, the Stone Age. C, his favourite age, the Middle. (laughs) Where all the high Dutch engineers... Because I'm from the Middle East. (laughs) No, it's because of the high Dutch engineers that keep turning up. Or D, the Bronze Age. So Iron, Stone, Middle, Bronze. When do we think Parliament, as we know it today, began to develop? Also, E, yesterday. <laughs> it's a possible answer. Anyone? Einstein, middle bronze. 
tomorrow. <coughs> Who is the lady here? Yeah, middle age. Oh, can we get the microphone? You're going for middle ages? I believe we're going up for another prize. Well done, correct? Alright then, so, um, we can have a few more of those at the end if we've got time. I reckon we go back to what, what are you doing now and what happens next while you wait to hear about what your actual nationality is. Um, so my, um, my application is pending at the home office, so I'm still waiting to hear from them. Uh, I haven't heard from them until now. I've uh, been three months and two weeks. I should hear, you know, up until, it takes up and up to six months. So any time between whenever you apply and six months. So some people got it in four months, some people got it in five months. So it depends uh, how long it takes. Uh, meanwhile, I, am, I got funded to do a podcast, which is about refugees, uh, which we call Integrate That. It's about refugee stories uh, and integration. If you ask me about integration, what, is, what integration is, I tell you, I have no idea. That's why I'm making this podcast. So it was funded by London College of Communication. Uh, we got some small funds to do that. And what we're doing in this podcast is actually making refugees make the stories from the scratch. So I would be making a couple of stories. Uh, some of my friends who are also refugees are going to make a couple of stories. But the, the different thing that we wanted to focus on is that refugees would own the story. They would make the story. They would not be just the subject of an interview. They would be the ones who you know, go into the studio, recording, choosing music, editing, and doing everything and presenting the stories to a lot of people. Because usually, most of the times... What happens is that when you're a refugee and, and people know you're a refugee and they want to cover something about refugees, they would think that all refugees live in a cave, and that at the end of the day, we all go, like the post office, <laughs> we all go there and you know, we know each other and we talk to each other. So every time someone, you know, a, you know, um, a, a media outlet or, or somebody wants to talk about refugees, they would ask me to bring a couple more with me. They say, oh, so could you please bring some refugees with you? I was like, yeah, what colors? <laughs> you pick. What? So that's what usually happens. So I thought it's not very ethical to do that. Well, it, it's being done in a, in a good well. I understand it. But still, it's not a very good thing. So I wanted to make this podcast about uh, integration stories and what's happening with people uh, going and in, living in here. So I remember once... For example, I went to, to, to have dinner with a family in, in, in England when I arrived. It was the first Christmas for me. And again, the asylum guidelines book that comes from the home office does not mention anything about culture. So they didn't tell me that everything on Christmas would be closed. I had no idea that I need... That's not in the life of the UK. That's not in there. That's that seems not quite important. There. They, I, did, I have no idea I need to store food. Like... No idea. So, and I was invited. I was like, what a coincidence. I was invited to these guys. Uh, so there were a couple who invited me. And they stereotyped me, of course. They thought, oh, you eat halal food. We didn't, we didn't bring any halal meat So because we are vegetarian. I said, awesome. Vegetarian Christmas. Uh, and they had like, you know, things that I don't really cook, like carrot and Brussels sprout. I didn't even know how to, to pronounce Brussels sprouts. What did you think of a Brussels sprout when you first tried it? It should be left in the field. It should, it should be, um, so I, I got... Like I went there, and in Syria, if you were invited to someone's house in Syria, you would starve for days before you go. And, and, and once you go there, you need to take you know, some clothes with you. Because once you start eating... And then the, you know, the, the fat would drop from your elbows and you need to, to wash yourself after you eat. And, you know, I went there and there was like carrot and Brussels sprout. And then in Syria, one of the, the what happens that halfway through, you say you're full. You know, it's a play we always play. You know, a game we always play. You say, oh, I'm full. And then your host would put, you know, a dead cow in your plate. And you're like, oh, you have to eat, to eat as much as you love us. And you have to eat to prove that you love them. We always say this. And then halfway through eating the carrots that were not even hot anymore, 
I was like, oh, I'm full. And the, and the host said, oh, you can wash your hands there. I was like, I don't even need to wash my hands. It's not real food. Um, and then they were making these plans for me, you know, for summer. They were being very good hosts. They said, hey, listen, Abdul, you live here in England in summer. We love doing a lot of things. And I found out that British people love paying money for things people can do for free, <laughs> which is camping. Uh, I was like, they wanted to take a refugee camping. <laughs> I was like, I've done my fair share of camping. <laughs> I can take you and your family camping. Um, so they were talking about these things. And I was like, oh my God, if, if I went through this, then I'm sure a lot of other refugees have been through this. And they have. I know some people who've been through this. I've, I've been people who were invited to some, some hosts, people. And they went through a lot of funny ideas uh, and funny things. And, and so these are one of the things I'm talking about. I'm going to talk about um, airport, uh, which I'm always randomly selected. Uh, so I'm always randomly selected, and when they select, so my name is Abdul Wahab, so it's always Abdul, and I think they randomly select me amongst all the Abduls, so they have a pool of Abduls, and I'm the one always selected, uh, and they ask you all these wacky, stupid questions, and you go through. So I'm I'm gonna put that in in my podcast as well. So it's all about all sorts of of stories that a refugee would face on a day to day. Okay, speaking of that, um, which two of these were very popular 60s British pop groups? So two, A, ABBA, B, The Beatles, C, The Rolling Stones, D, The Beach Boys. So I'm looking for two. Who reckons they've got two? Do you have two? In the 60s. In the 60s. I wasn't even born in the 60s. Look, if you want to be British, you should know this stuff. <laughs> ABBA, Beatles, Rolling Stones, Beach Boys, two. Big in the 60s? Anyone? Oh. Who, who needs the mic? Who's, who's saying something? Oh, um, lady at the back, right? Um, the well done. You get a prize. Woo! What was the answer? Beatles and the Rolling Stones. The other two are 70s, I guess. Um, yes, yeah, it's, it's hard for you to know that when you lived in a country that didn't allow you to get on the internet. Yeah, no, it's, 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 it's impossible. We, it's we, had, we had Backstreet Boys. What's her name? Backstreet Boys and What's Britney Spears. Again, not, nice not, not British. Britney back, Backstreet Boys. Backstreet Boys and Britney Spears. Are they big in Syria? Yeah, CDs. On the CDs. Backstreet's back, all right. Backstreet Boys and Britney Spears were very famous. Not, again, not British. I don't know why you guys never made any music or films or... You just make Python, whatever the guy is. Britney Spears is big in Syria. Oh, huge. A huge thing. The Hit Me Baby One More Time video. People take it literally, so men do it literally. <laughs> was it on one of the two TV channels? Huh? Was it on one of the two TV channels? No, it was a CD. And it's not... Oh, so you, it's a CD, you have to buy it from one of those dodgy places. It's when not, you, it's not main, main street, you don't see a poster. So when you forbid. say dodgy here, it's a man in the pub with the CDs in his coat. That was like the classic. Pretty, That's not what you had. Is, no, but we had those dodgy shops where you go to the shop and you know what you want you know you go and they say hey what are those yes. the post office <laughs> and they sell you know britney spears or uh, shakira or... some classic naughties mm -hmm. tunes um so we're getting to the last 10 minutes of the show has anyone got any questions for abdul lady at the back um earlier on, very early on you mentioned how facebook was the vehicle by which you're able to start your activism. Having come to the UK, how much do you think social media has helped you integrate? Since I've arrived here, I haven't posted anything for six years. The, my profile picture is the last thing I posted on Facebook, which was the day I got my asylum paper, which was the 22nd of April 2013. I was in Bournemouth. Uh, my, for my asylum interview, so when I uh, uh, applied for the asylum interview, they asked me to go to the Isle of Wight. I was like, I'm not taking a boat again. No. I went to the GP and I told him, hey, listen, I'm not, I'm not sick, but I need a sick note. This is my asylum interview. This is very serious. Give me something. And the guy said, uh, flu symptoms. He said, I'll take it. 
And then I sent it to the home office, and they sent me to Bournemouth instead. I said that the, the closest, <laughs> the closest point to the to the port. Uh, but since I arrived here, I stopped. I, I I didn't use Facebook at all. I use it for my research. So I contact people in Syria still through Facebook. Uh, if I want to do any research, uh, documentation, because it's still a big thing on Syria. So Twitter and Facebook are still huge for documentation. But for life. Uh, for life integration in here, not really at all, because uh, I, I do most of the things like face to face or I like to see people, I like going out. And on Facebook, all I see, like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, I see amazing life for other people that I'm not part of, and that's really, really depressing. I, I know these people, some of my friends are really depressed, and they see a doctor, and yet they post these pictures on the mountain or somewhere. And looking amazing and, and cool. I'm like, no, I'm not gonna be a part of that. So, but but I do use Twitter just you know to get the news, research, uh, to see what's going on in Syria, and to contact people who are still in Syria. Any other questions? Yeah, we got one here. Yeah, I was just wondering about the stand up comedy part and how you got into that and whether that started in Syria or, or here or yeah, how that happened. Well, well, the stand-up started in here. So I just started this year, uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, I was still very new and it was, I started it in, in, in June, in June. And uh, so I did a couple of gigs. Uh, once you're a refugee, you can just blackmail people emotionally until they're, <laughs> I'm a refugee, you know. And then they say, yeah, that's my, my favorite line. Whatever you want to do, you say, I'm a refugee. And you get access to whatever you want. So I was. So you got into this podcast. <laughs> I got into this podcast. I was a warm up act for uh, Romish. Ranganathan. Yep. Not bad, just starting at the top and just yes. working your way down through famous comedians. No, because I'm a refugee, that's how we do it. <laughs> um, so I just started as a way to vent out uh, our integration stories of what's going on with me. So I don't do this. So my, my material is all about life in the UK and here. What's it like for a refugee to to go to the market, to, to buy things like Oster Fry, things I don't even understand or know how to read them or pronounce them correctly. So that was all my material. And it helps me, you know, uh, I was doing one this morning. It was the worst one ever. I was doing it in a very serious talk. So there's a conference, you know, for refugees. Uh, and it was a very serious one. There was an MP there. And they wanted to break between serious talks and they brought me and this is not how comedy works you can't put a comedian between serious people and all the people it was morning all the people you know eating croissant and, and just sipping coffee and again this is not the right one and they were looking at me like what's wrong with you you don't know how to preheat an oven uh, I don't know that was my worst after it I felt like I wanted to take a shower after it because it was my worst ever performance and I couldn't wait until I get off the stage. Yeah. Do you think it was just too early in the morning for comedy? Is that the problem? Uh, I think it is the wrong uh, people I was talking to. You know, when, if you're in an event when people are eating croissant, this house, and, and sipping <laughs> coffee, this is not, not the place. It's like to sound like your friend in UKIP. Um, any other questions for Abdul? No? Okay, um, we have five minutes to go. We can do some more questions from the terrible book. Or we can go up to the bar right now and get drinking. It is up to you. Would anyone like some more chances to win some more prizes? Well, let's have one more question. Go on then. All right. Shall I make it a good one? Yeah. I'll make it a good one. Hmm. It's RT. It's RT. Which artist is considered to be the one who raised the profile of landscape painting? Very Syrian thing. Yes. All, all Syrians. Know it was it. all landscape that I saw on that video. That's all what my, my dad talks to you know, during On dinner, his birthday, Syria. which yeah, you do yeah. not celebrate. We have A, John Constable. B, Thomas Gainsborough. C, David Allen. Or D, Joseph Turner. Constable Gainsborough, Alan Turner. What a lineup! There's a Turner Prize, so I would say it's a Turner. Interesting. Pals, a deduction. 
Um, anyone? Anyone want to get in there? We uh, can we get a microphone over here? Because um, you're still going to get a prize anyway, because we have loads. <laughs> <laughs> I want to get rid of the Theresa May constable. mask. We're saying constable. You're saying Turner. No, I think constable was an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> they can't all be engineers. Uh, yeah, the the answer is Joseph Turner. So you get a prize. Yeah. We, know it. we didn't even rehearse. That. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's not it's not constable this time round. Um, well, thank you all very much for coming to uh, the first live recording of Freelance Pod. And can we get a round of applause for Abdul for giving me so much time and effort? He's already done stand up this morning. As he mentioned, it was not great. Um, and it turns out he likes this room a lot better. So thank you for being a really great audience. And yes, thank you for coming along to see Freelance Pod. This is us on Twitter. That's the Freelance Pod official Twitter. That's me, Sir Chandrika. That's Abdul. He does use Twitter a little bit. And feel free to tweet us, tell us what you think, and to ask for more of those prizes. And yeah, enjoy the rest of the festival. I'm sure we will see you around. Thank you again for coming. Well, that was 90 minutes of live recording. I thought it was pretty fun and I hope you did too. If you do have any feedback on this episode, I'd love to hear it. So get in touch via social media, via the newsletter, um, send a pigeon over, whatever you want to do. (laughs) And I'd love to hear more from you. Also, if you haven't reviewed the podcast yet, please do get over to Apple Podcasts and do that if you can, because it does help more people find the podcast and the bigger the audience the more that I'm able to keep making these episodes. That's all for this week. I'll be back next time with another exciting guest to talk to me about creativity and the internet. If you enjoy the podcast, please do rate, review and subscribe over on Apple Podcasts and why not tell a friend too? This helps our community grow and that enables me to keep making Freelance Pod.